My name is Jamie Gerganis and um, I'm a, a, a family and educator coordinator with Heartland Area Education Agency out of Ames. And um, I'm, one of my slides I'll tell more about myself, but um, I want to first talk about Partners in Travel is the, uh, the pre name of the presentation. And I did not come up with the name. I have to give credit to the, um, I'm a graduate of the Seeing Eye. All of my dogs have come from the Seeing Eye in Morristown, New Jersey. And their, um, one of their uh, DVDs that they put out that when I go to present about guide dogs and service animals to people um, that I can uh, they sometimes show uh, uh, one of their DVDs. And one of them is called Partners in Travel. And so I borrowed it because they told me that as, as a graduate of the Seeing Eye giving presentations, I represent them and can use their material. So, uh, many of the materials are from there, and I thought it was such a cool name that I was just going to, uh, and I had I didn't have very much time to come up with one, and I'm not very creative, so I thought I'll just use their name. <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay, so you can go into the next slide, Deb, and so the disclaimer is that I just want to let everyone know that I am. Um, I, I'm here to give you information about service animals and that um, any legal questions, if anyone has any, um, the uh, Department of Education's lawyer, Thomas Mays, would be the one that we would pass those questions along to. So, um, what was the last name? Sorry. Um, Thomas Mays. And I believe, I don't know, Deb, did they want to take notes if, if there's anything that I can't answer or I think it's a legal uh, matter, then, uh, then they can do it. So, but I can, I can answer ones about guide dogs, but not, not the other one. So, okay, next one is, okay, this is the one, who am I? Um, the picture is of me getting wishes, and the person in the picture with me is actually the lifelike statue of Morris Frank, who is the first person to, um, he's the one who, who uh, just went over and, and uh, helped get the seeing eye started. So, and that was back in 1923 um, when he went over and, and uh, so it, it looks like a real person, a real man. People will say, who's that man standing there? They say, well, it's actually a statue and it's of him with his first guide dog, Buddy. And, um, and he uh, consequently named all of his guide dogs Buddy, even though that's what they weren't named. They were not named. So. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to change their names if you want to. I. I've only changed one of my dog's names, so, but not, not very far from what, they, what it was. So, um, so about me, I'll, I'll talk about, um, Wishes is my fifth guide dog. And um, I, I'll tell you a little about my background. In the, um, when I was not born blind, um, in 1986, I was a junior in nursing school in, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And I was having some trouble with uh, seeing I had been uh, diabetic since I was four years old. And my eye doctor had me go to see a retinal specialist at the beginning of the school year. Um, but he said, I'll just come back if you see any, if you're starting to see any problems. Well, I had just gotten a new pair of contacts and I thought it was my new contacts. So I went to see the uh, contact person um, just on the street in Pittsburgh because it's not where my hometown was. And so I um, went in there and he says, well, as part of me doing anything on your contacts, I need to do an eye exam on you. So I said, oh, what the heck, go ahead. So he, he did and he, he was very concerned. He said, are you seeing a doctor for your eyes? And I said, oh yeah. So um, he said, well, I think you need to go see your doctor um, tomorrow. So I made the appointment and um, I had my first of many laser eye treatments, um, and I was one of the first people to use the laser treatment in that office. It was a brand new way to treat uh, diabetic retinopathy at the time. So, so I, but I plugged away with nursing school, and um, in, in April, I uh, applied for and was accepted 
at, at an internship at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, and I would work throughout my senior year there, all through the summer and throughout my senior year, and then be hired as a graduate nurse at, at Children's, and that was just my dream job. I absolutely loved it there. Um, but in July of that summer, um, my good eye uh, started, it, it had hemorrhage, and so I went to see my eye doctor, and the next day I had my first of many eye surgeries, and the rest of that year I still <laughs> attempted to finish nursing school, <laughs> and um, yeah, and I was uh, finally in, I think it was like in November of that year, they, the nursing school, this was, this was in 1987 by then. You have to remember there was no Americans with Disabilities Act. So um, the school kind of kindly said to me, I think you need to think of some different, uh, different schooling. And they asked me to withdraw from nursing because um, they just didn't know how to get me through nursing school at the time. So, so that was really hard because I was a senior in nursing and I loved it. And um, so I ended up uh, doing some career thing, uh, counseling and decided to go to the School of Social Work that was still at, in Pittsburgh. And so I was um, not being able to see very well. Everything was real fuzzy and blurry, but I was still getting around <laughs> campus. Um, just, just my friends would drop me off at buildings and I would kind of trail the walls and just doing things that are really kind of stupid if you think about it nowadays, <laughs> how they did things. And I went to visit the disability resources office there and she said to me, Jamie, you cannot keep walking around Pittsburgh trailing walls and so you have to think about going for some rehabilitation services somewhere. So in March of that year, I uh, went to spend three months at the what was called the Guild for the Blind in Pittsburgh. Um, here it's the, um, the Department for the Blind. And so I learned cane travel and how to use Braille and how to cook and do all that stuff to live independently. And so then when I... Uh, one thing led to another and I decided to transfer to Penn State instead of being at Pitt and I was in the School of Social Work. So when I was at Penn State, I met this lady, her name was Rana, and she had this wonderful guide dog that got her all over Penn State with no problems because Penn State was big <laughs> and, and I would you know, it would take me a while to get to different places with my cane. And, but I, I, you know, so after I applied and um, the summer after my first year there, I uh, was paired with my first guide dog um, and her name was Kina and she was a black lab. And so um, soon after that, I, when I graduated, I moved to Pittsburgh and um, I, well, I, the, my parents had since moved there, so I moved back to Pittsburgh, and uh, that's where I got my first job, and then I uh, had met somebody at the Seeing Eye, and he and I got in touch with each other, and one thing led to another, and I ended up here in Iowa, <laughs> and, and got married, I decided to, um, get, uh, because I couldn't find a job when I moved out here, I went to grad school and yeah, my master's and then um, started working at Iowa State. And then I had my son who was uh, very preemie. Um, he was a twin, we lost his brother, but um, Alex was so tiny when I had to go back to work that I just couldn't. So I, um, I, I left that job and then when he was about six and my daughter was two, I started with where I'm working now. And I'm on my fifth guide dog. So I've, I've had, um, a uh, let's see, El Kina was a black lab. Then I had Rosie, who was a golden. And then I had um, Ellie, and that's the one I changed. Her name was Ellen. And I'm sorry, but that's not a dog's name. <laughs> I, I called her Ellie. So Ellie is what, she, and she was a black lab, a cute little one. And then I had Candace, and Candace died in July, and um, she died unexpectedly, unexpectedly. And so then 
I ended up getting wishes and I just brought her home in October. So, and they've all come from the seeing eye in New Jersey. So it's, uh, now there, there are other guide dog schools that I'll go over. So, okay, so that's about me. So you can go on to the next one. What was the purpose for the changes? Okay, for um, most, I, I'm speaking for the seeing eye and I'm pretty sure other service dogs are the same way. Um, when you get a, a guide dog from the seeing eye, they're typically anywhere from 20, 20 to 23, 24 months old, almost two years old. And they would like you to retire your dog by the time they're 10, possibly 11. Um, I have always retired mine at 10. Um, Ellie, I had to retire early because she had arthritis um, and um, couldn't go up and down steps very easily. And um, when I would walk home from the bus, by the time we'd get home, I was in front of her. So she just wasn't <laughs> keeping up very well. And, um, so she's the only one that I retired early. Candace died quite early. She was only six. So, um, but yeah, it's, you, they, they just, they want you to, they need a retirement. And, um, and some, and they age, you know, they're, when they're about seven, you know, 10, my, husband's dog is 11 and he uh, finally said I really shouldn't be working him I said no you really shouldn't be working him so it's, it's hard to give up your dog but I had always um, applied for a new one and retired my dog um, the day before I took off on the airplane to go get my new one so it was so kind of a care, do you, can you still you, care for them as that, a pet or do that's a personal preference. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We've my first two we found homes for. My Ellie, my kids were old enough that um, they wanted to keep her, and and so and then of course Candace died. So, but yeah, we we've, we've typically found homes for our dogs, and they are not hard to find homes for. Um, people, they're amazing dogs. They're so well trained and behaved that uh, most people want your dog. So, is it yeah. possible that someone who's been through more more of a mm -hmm. Like an emotional support animal mm -hmm. could find a way to adopt a retired service dog? Probably, okay. yeah. Because one of my stipulations for finding a dog, for finding an owner for the dog, is that because um, I had so many people want my Ellie and um, I, m most of them worked and these dogs are used to being with us all the time. And, and I know once they retire, you're supposed to just let them, they might want to just sleep, but um, they're, they're used to having companionship all the time. So I really didn't want somebody who was going to leave her at home all the time. So that would, would be a good, um, you know, one of the options. One of the options that was for one of my husband's dog was that um, the Madrid home was considering her um, have, getting him for a therapy dog. And so they would, they would make really good dogs in those purposes. So, um, so this slide here talked about two organizations, um, Assistance Dogs International and then the Iowa Guide Dog Federation. They both set minimum standards for uh, any service animals and make sure that they, uh, it makes them accredited service animals. And they have a huge list, well, not as many for, for uh, guide dogs, but the Assistance Dogs International has an extensive list of places and agencies that um, are in different areas around the United States for getting a dog, a service animal. So, and, and one of the, the points that I wanna make is that there are many places around um, that will claim that they uh, follow these these standards that the um, Assistance Dogs International set forth for accrediting their animals. But if they are not accredited through these either one of these two agencies, then they haven't been put through through like the scrutiny of those animals. So and they aren't considered accredited. So. Cheney, can yeah. I ask another question? Sure. I don't know what's easiest or best for you, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. can you explain or do you later mm -hmm. on? I don't know the, the differences between yeah. assistant yeah. dogs. Oh yeah, no, but I, I, it's coming up. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. Thank so you. no, that's okay. So we can go on to the next slide. So 
Okay. So, ah. us, yep, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> so the service animal defined by Titles 2 and 3 of the Americans with Disabilities Act is an animal that is specifically trained to, um, to work or perform tasks that will benefit a person with a disability. And so that's, that's what makes it a, a service animal. And emotional support, comfort, and therapies are not a service animal according to the ADA. So, and um, yeah. And so like if you have a, a pet bird, that is not a service animal. So they, because they're, yeah, they're not specifically trained. So, so we can go on to the next slide. So, um, so the work or task that um, performed for the, it's directly related to the handler's disability. So, um, and the examples I'll give, I'll go through the different ones. You can go on to the next slide real quick. So we have um, guide dogs. So of course, um, guide dogs are specifically trained to keep a person with a vision impairment safe on the streets and find, they find doors, they find steps, they, they just make sure that they travel safely. And, um, and so that's their specific. So then we have the hearing or signal dog. And those dogs will, are specifically trained to uh, show their owner, uh, they, they somehow, um, I think they nudge them or somehow let the, the owner know that um, the doorbell's ringing or if somebody comes up to them on the street, they, they specifically are, you know, notify them of sounds that the person might not hear. The psychiatric service dog. That one is very um, specifically trained to help a person with uh, some type of emotional anxiety, a PTSD, any types of uh, psychiatric disability. And they are, they, they take a long time to train and they, they might uh, show the person how to um, get, or like if they're having an anxiety attack, they'll make sure they go to a safe place. Or if they're in a large room and they see that the person's getting anxious, they will somehow nudge them to tell them that they need to leave the room. Or if they um, see that they're starting to, to might need their medication, they will get the medication for the person. So they're, they're really individually trained for the person's specific disability. Um, and they, it's, it's a, quite extensive training. I mean, not that these guys aren't special, you know, but they, it's, it's more individualized for the psychiatric service dogs. Um, so then there's a, a sensory signal dog and those are for trained for uh, people with autism. And the dog, again, it's very similar to the psychi psychiatric service dog. They signal the person when they're doing things that are like maybe hand flapping or, um, or getting anxious, so um, they're they're very specific to the the, the things that uh, the person with autism needs. Um, the seizure response dog; those are for people with epilepsy or for, with diabetes. Um, they the dogs can somehow sense. Um, usually, I think it's some kind of smell that that a person that's either having a seizure or like if you're having a high or low blood sugar your body gives off a scent that the dog notices. Now, my dogs have never noticed when my blood sugar is low. So it's very, they, these dogs are trained to do it. So it's a different training. It's, it's very specific. And um, so, and then um, there's a, another one that I did not put on here, but that's the dogs through canine companions that are trained to help people um, that are in wheelchairs that um, might not be able to use their hands or um, and and I know they also train monkeys and we've heard they've trained miniature horses um, so um, those are different but they the dogs that I've seen can help a person pull their wheelchair um, they might help the person um, get up out of their bag that they typically ha have hanging on the back of their wheelchair they'll they can tell the dog, get my wallet, get my bus tickets, and the dog will be, have been trained to know which pouch to get that particular item out of. So, yeah.
It's kind of neat. Okay, the next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, so other support. Um, so um, there's other support um, animals and emotional support animals might be used as um, a, a part of a person's medical treatment plan. They are not recognized as service animals, particular service animals, and um, they provide companionship and um, you know l relieve loneliness and stuff, but they aren't specifically trained um, to provide something um, for a person's disability. So that's that's what sets them apart from the um, being covered as a service animal under the ADA. So they couldn't go to school with a child then. Necessarily. Okay, I have a slide on that too. Okay. Uh, that's no, a little, wait. yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all, okay, so you go to the next one. Okay, a, what is a therapy dog? So a therapy dog is just as it sounds. It's a dog that provides comfort and companionship, and it's usually, they usually are the ones that they're trained to be able to go into the nursing homes, into hospitals, um, they go to disaster relief sites, and they're there just to be the presence of a dog. They're, they're typically dogs that um, will do that. So, um, so okay, next is an emotional support animal. And under the US law, it's a pet. Um, and that's what sets it apart too. Um, it's a pet that provides comfort um, and support to a person with um, anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, but it's not the same as a psychiatric service dog that has been specifically trained for that. And, um, and so it, that's what sets it apart. Okay, does your pet need to be trained to be a service animal? That's all debatable. Um, and um, <laughs> um, any, so if you have a diagnosed disability, you're, you're, you're your pet can become your emotional support animal as long as it meets the, um, the, the guidelines that the ADA has for how a dog should be, behave and be cared for and taken care of. Um, so there's, I'll go over those specific things. Um, and that's, and, and I know, unfortunately, there are ways to go online and register just any pet you have as a service animal. And you can also go online and get a little kerchief to hang around the dog's neck that will say something on it, like PTSD dog or um, emotional support. So again, they don't come from a, one of the agencies that are accredited. So the handler's responsibility, this is what's important. Um, the handler or the owner of the animal is responsible, responsible for the care and supervision for their animal at all times. Um, so that's where if you're considering getting a service animal for a young child, um, you have to remember that the young child may not be responsible enough to take care of, of an animal on their own. Um, that's where the school might not let the animal in, in the school because um, it's not the teacher's responsibility to take the dog out or to make sure um, it's taken care of. Um, now, for example, my dog, when I was in the hospital, my dog went home. Um, even though I would have loved to have had her with me, um, it's not the job of the nurse to take your dog out in the morning and, you know, and I wasn't going to have family there and stuff. So I, whenever, that's just how it is. Now, my dog was allowed to come in the hospital um, and when my son was in the hospital, my dog could come with me as well, but um, I would still be responsible for taking care of the dog. And that's when a business has the right to ask you to, n to not bring your dog in um, is if you're not taking care of the dog or following the order. Um, so they, that means they have to be under constant control and so say, for example, if I bring my cute guide dog into um, a movie and all and the whole time during the movie she barked, they would they would legally be allowed to ask me to leave with the dog or at least 
not bring the dog into the theater. Um, if, um, if I was going into a grocery store and my dog growled at every person that went by her, um, they could ask me not to bring the dog in the grocery store. Um, so it's, it's, um, it, it, it's just that's the, you know, the seeing eye raises its dogs to not bark and to not be aggressive towards other animals um, and other people. We have extensive training. Um, we go through doggy distraction on all the routes that we walk, um, whether they're planned or unplanned because there are people in the neighborhood that have dogs out there. Um, so our dogs are just very well behaved dogs and that's, and I, I'm just a stickler with keeping my dog in the best behavior and that's why she lays here next to me. Every now and then she sticks her head up in my lap and says, hi mom, I'm here. But for the most part, my dogs, I've always taught them, you know, I want them just like she is right now. <laughs> and um, that's, uh, that's one of the things, like if you take an animal to a school that they um, have to behave. So, okay, so um, yeah, and one other, one other time that um, like when my daughter, I went to my daughter's classroom for um, uh, her a birthday party and um, one of the little girls is allergic to dogs. And so my daughter said, mom, I don't know what you're gonna do with them. I think I had Ellie at the time. She said, but you know, Nikki's a, a, allergic to animals. And so I, I said, well, well, I'll take care. So I left Ellie in the principal's office and um, which, you know, the principal sure didn't mind having Ellie in the room, with, <laughs> but, um, but that was one of the, you know, I could have said, well, I'll sit on the other side of the room, but I just said, no, I'll just not have her in there instead of just not coming to the party because parents were invited. It was a, you know, it wasn't a birthday party. It was some kind of little get together where the kids made things and, you know, parents come. <laughs> so, so I've, I've made exceptions and stuff like that. So I, I've never been rude about saying I'm sorry I you know I have to have my dog with me but yeah and and I won't take my dog to concerts to the kids band concerts that's just mean it's it's yeah. you know the sometimes the it's mean for the, parents have to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I I took my one dog one time and um they at the very end of the concert they had a surprise where the Iowa State University um, marching band came from behind, all the way marching down, cheer with their drums and everything. My dog, the dogs just shot up and they were like freaked out. And I was like, oh, poor dogs. Yeah, so so there's a time and place. And, and plus, you know, at some of those um, theaters and stuff, the the floors are slanted and that is just I mean the poor dogs are slipping and it's just not right so I I, I take my cane then so the handlers rights um, so that just means that the titles two and three of the ADA say that our dogs all service animals are allowed anywhere that the public has access to and that's a picture of me and wishes and my um, one of my my tr training companion with her little dog, and her little dog's name was Nikita, that she changed to Chiquita. <laughs> because, because Rosa was Hispanic, and Chiquita means little one. Aww. And so she says, so she changed it to, Niki, to Chiquita. Does, does this apply to churches as well? Yes, I take, okay. I take her, and I've trained my dog. She slips under the chair, and she's, she's quiet, and yeah. She doesn't, okay. uh, and that's another thing, you know, if she barked during the whole service, then they could say, no, well, you can't bring. Well, it seems to me that's yeah. the mark of an yeah. uh, animal that's not well enough trained. Yeah, to be in public, yeah. Uh, do you have any suggestions about mm -hmm. what to do with people who are obviously trying to pass off a dog who's not a service dog as a service yeah. dog? Um, yeah, I know. I've run across that many times, and that frustrates me, but, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do. Um, I know I had somebody ask me where they could get um, the, a harness for their dog or where they could get a, um, a one of those little designated kerchiefs. And my answer was, well, the, seeing, uh, the agency that trained your dog should have given you the 
correct equipment with your dog. My dog came with her harness and the seeing eye is very particular. When, my, when our dogs pass um, or when we retire them, the harness goes back to the seeing eye. The harness is the property of the seeing eye. The dog is mine. I can do what I want, but I'm not allowed. You cannot put, it's illegal to put a, a seeing eye or I don't know if the other guide dog schools are like that, but the seeing eye, you cannot sell them. On, on Craigslist or anything, it, that's illegal to do. So, um, yeah, I've always taken my harness back when I go to get my next dog. So, and, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to do, but that, that it bothers me when I see somebody with um, a dog, that, especially when they're not behaving well. I, we did have an incident at my church where a person came with a dog that had one of those little vests on and it snarled and growled at everyone and in particular at my dog and um, when I called the seeing eye he said uh, the trainer there said Jamie this is where the ADA is in your favor because your dog is a uh, you know from an accredited sir is an accredited service dog and um, you know and under control and the ADA specifically says your dog has to be it, uh, you know, in under control at all times, and that dog wasn't, so. Okay, so employment is, um, as far, for a reasonable, employers are supposed to, if a person has a, di a diagnosed disability, um, documented disability, do um, employers have to provide a reasonable accommodations, and one of them is to allow a service animal to come to work with them. Um, if it is an emotional support animal, um, like for me, when I have my dog, the employers cannot say to me, what does your dog do for you? Why do you need it? But if you do just, if you have just an emotional support animal um, w that you uh, feel will help you at work, then um, I think you can get, you can get documentation, uh, medical documentation that says this dog will help you work. And then it's up to the discretion of the employer to whether or not they accept that. Um, so housing, there's under the, um, the Fair Housing Act, um, our service animals are not considered to be pets. And so they are allowed in um, all, you know, in apartments um, they, and they cannot be, I, we, I, we could never be a, um, charged a pet fee. Like if somebody else wants to bring their dog to, um, or animal to, an apartment, then they, they can be charged a pet fee. Now, if my dog ruins an apartment, then that's my responsibility as, you know, making sure my dog's under control. So um, then that's a different story. <laughs> so, okay, next is for <coughs> education. Now, a person, a student with a disability that uses a service animal, which would be the guide dog, the hearing ear dog, one of the ones that was on that, that list, um, they are permitted in the schools. Now, um, the seeing eye, and I think most guide dog schools, um, you have to be 16 to go through their training. Um, and that is because most 16 year olds can take care of an animal on their own by then. So, um, um, so that's the big difference there. Now, it, it says on here that other animals or um, sometimes the other the emotional support animals may be um, the IEP team or the 504 team might consider that but um, that would be uh, rare I think to be able to have that again it's it would that would probably be a Thomas Mays question but um, if it's a accredited service animal such as a guide dog or something then they are definitely allowed in the schools so uh, in college, um, most colleges, I, I mean, colleges have to allow uh, service animals in them. My dogs were always allowed wherever and um, they were not um, declined. Now, it's always best to call the college that your son or daughter or family member is planning to attend and then you can find out more about that. But um, for the most part, a service animal is, is allowed at, um, at this college. And now I don't know about the other animals, like just the emotional assistance. I know my, my niece has, um, her, her family pet is, she's brought it to school this year 
um, and it's there in her apartment, but it is not go, do, do not go to, co to class with her. Um, so for transportation, so all service animals are allowed on uh, public transportation, like uh, buses, taxis. Um, now, I, I'm pretty sure, I'd, I've never used Uber, but um, I know they're people's personal cars, so I'm not sure what, how that is, but I guess if they're going to be offering public transportation with then I think they have to accept a guide dog or a, you know, one of the service animals on there. Um, but one of the things is that they are any form of transportation or even any public place can request that I muzzle my dog. Um, in the almost 30 years I've used dogs, I've never been asked to muzzle my dog, but I always have, that's what's in her little pouch on the side of her harness. It's, it's called a gentle leader and it's really not a muzzle, but it looks like one. <laughs> so it's, um, it uh, just goes around her, her nose and it helps me control her head um, if she's sniffing too much or um, just, just in places that I think I need a little more control for her. And I've hardly ever had to use that on my dogs as well, but they, they, the seeing eye pretty much makes you carry it with you because if you're, if you are asked to put a muzzle on your animal and you don't have it, then you, you they can deny you access. Next is air, the air travel. So the Air Carrier Access Act says that all service animals can travel in the main cabin with us. Um, so that would be all the, the hearing, ear, the psychiatric, emotional support animals. Um, that would be, you'd have to call the airlines and find out what you might need to take that animal with you. Um, you might need to get uh, paperwork from a doctor, um, a medical, medical notation. You also need to get uh, recent health records for the dog or the whatever animal it is you're trying to bring on the airplane. Um, and the airplanes might have rules about what animals they will actually allow on the airplane. Now, my dogs have all flown in the main cabin with me and I just tuck them under. And um, so I, I was quite the sight with uh, uh, my guide dogs. And, you know, I had a child on a, in a little harness restraint and a baby in a, a little snuggy, and then there's me with my guide dog, and I was on trucking through the airport going to visit my parents. So I, I took up a lot of space, but <laughs> I always tried to get the bulkhead if I could. <laughs> so where to go? So the best thing I can tell you about where to go is um, to go online, to go to one of those first two agencies, the Assistance Dogs International, or the Iowa, or the, the International Federation, the Guide Dog Federation, they have lists of schools. Um, I can tell you for guide dogs, I read a book uh, that had, I think there was nine or 10 guide dog schools without, throughout the United States, and it had all the statistics about them and everything. And my friend's dog was from the Seeing Eye, but I also knew someone else who had uh, a dog from leader schools in Michigan. And I'm just from all the information I read, I, I chose the seeing eye. But that's kind of what you would want to do is just find out geographically. Like the other place, there's a place in California called Guide Dogs International. But I was in Pennsylvania and I just didn't want to travel all the way to California. So I chose seeing eye in New Jersey for mine and, and I never regretted that. But um, my a friend of mine from church, um, was is applying for a dual trained uh, dog, a psychiatric service animal, follow, and also a dog to help her with her balance, so that because she she has balance problems from a brain injury, so that dog is she's getting it through a place called Greater Service Dogs of America. It's in North Dakota. Um, she was wanted me to let everyone know it's it's quite the application process. The seeing eye, I have to, you know, I, I apply on, you know, I, there's an online application and then um, it's very simple. It's, you know, your, you know, where you are, how, what your, do you prefer uh, coming in this winter, spring, summer, fall? Do you have, um, what's your height, your weight, where are you going to work the dog the most and things like that. And then the seeing eye typically sends someone out if you're a first time user 
to meet you and to get an idea of what you're like as far so they can match the dog to you. Um, I know my friend is the same thing with hers. It's a she said it's about a 30 page application to get one of these the, the duly trained dogs. Um, she did say that a lot of the psyche, the psychiatric service dog organizations cater to veterans. So um, she was having a lot of trouble finding places that would just take um, someone who wasn't a veteran. Um, and, and unfortunately, the dogs are quite expensive, but there are grants and application, uh, different scholarships to get, um, help defray the cost of the dog. This, the guide dogs are not there. The first dog is about, I think it's $200 now to get your first dog. And that includes my airfare out there and staying at their on their estate for a whole month, and um, it's it's really a a nice. But then they, my second dog, your your con, second, third, fourth, fifth dog after that are only fifty dollars. And if you are a military a veteran, it your dog only costs you a dollar. When you go into the seeing eye, I went. I had to take three weeks of time off from work, but luckily they let me consider it sick time to go get my dog. Um, when I was a college student, I went during the summer when I was out of school. Um, it's just a priority. If you want the dog, you have to just take that step because it's important to bond with your dog away from your family, away from it. Be, um, because I did have a, what was called a home placement when I was pregnant with my twins, um, they would not let me, for liability reasons, come to the seeing eye to, um, to train, so they brought my dog to me. And uh, although Rosie was a sweet, wonderful dog, she was the, the one that um, it, it, you didn't bond as well with them. Um, she, she bonded with a lot of people, but <laughs> and she was a good worker, um, but uh, you really do bond with them really well when you go with them. And if you're getting a specific, like the psychiatric service animal dog, I know you have to go there and spend time so that you can learn how to do what that dog is trained to do. Um, because it's not just, you, you can't just bring a dog home and expect to know how to, to do it. And even with a guide dog, I, I know how to use a guide dog, but every dog is different and every dog does their job a little different in how they um, work with you. And every time I go there, they adjust like this dog. Um, they had to give me a different harness handle because um, because I'm short. And so it, it just they they could just see where your arm placement is supposed to be and how you're supposed to do it. So it's just real important that you go somewhere where you train with the dog and um, get to know you know, how to work it. And I, I believe the canine companions too, the ones that train dogs for people in with wheelchairs. I mean, you, they specifically train that dog for the person and it takes a year or more. And then the person has to go out and be with the dog too, so that they know how to, you know, the commands. So the next slide is um, Q and A. So if you have any other, questions that I haven't answered. The seeing eye expect, they say to expect a six to nine month wait. So my first dog, because I was a college student, I applied knowing that I wanted to go in the summer. Um, my second one, I just applied and said, um, my babies are due in this time, I want I need to go before they're born, <laughs> and that's when they said, "Nope, we're gonna have to come out to you." Um, my third one, um, let's see, for Ellie, it was the same thing. I I just we, we I fitted into when I was not working, so that I could um, just fit that in the right time, and and then with with um, my last dog with Candace, yeah. it was the same thing. I I I said I. I really would like to go. I applied early, but I said, but I specifically told them I I would like to go in. Um, thank you in uh, in May or June. I don't want to. I I cannot traipse around New Jersey in the winter. I just can't be in the the cold and snow, and I don't do that around here either. So you know, I I get out. 
and now your your dogs will be this the seeing eye is very particular because they they match you with your the, knowing um, how fast they they they, they want to have how do they word they word it that um, they want to make sure that they have the right dog chosen for you and they usually have about two or three dogs in mind for each person and they will not have you come out they won't ha tell you what class you're going to be in until they know that there's going to be a dog that matches you because that that's the worst thing to go out there and then the dog that they thought worked didn't so um, and so they, like even when I, this dog and my dog died in July um, they I kept I would call the her name was Paula I kept calling her I'd say do you know if I'm going to be in September or October's or whatever and she'd say I can't tell you that yet Jamie we have to make sure we have a dog for you and so then they finally you know let you know and and I think that's how some of these other well I know for um, the psychiatric service dogs um, because they're so specifically trained for that person's specific needs they want to make sure that they have um, several dogs that will meet you that's one thing my friend Chris said that this place in North Dakota the dog will choose she the, the dogs will all be trained when she and they will have like two or three dogs that fit her specific needs but when she gets there they will see which one bonds with her the best and then she'll that's what how they'll so I found that kind of interesting because um, we're we are paired with them and my dogs have always bonded with me rather quickly um, if you get a shepherd shepherds bond with their they have a hard time letting go of their former master who is their trainer at the scene and so those dogs cried and cry and cry all the time it, it's hard and um, you know the I always joke that the the labs and the retrievers go to whomever feeds them and so <laughs> as soon as we get our dogs we are in charge of feeding from day one you know you're in charge of everything with your dog so but yeah and I, I really think that's how most of the service animal the accredited places um, they will be in contact with you and um, they just want the best dog for you and um, it, it will be a waiting period and especially the ones that are trained like for the, the um, psychiatric service for the, compa the companion animals that for people in wheelchairs though they take a while so you need to apply at the seeing eye you're there for one month and then um, for your first dog and then three weeks for your your dogs after that um, now I know the I, I think my, my friend Chris said she would be there in North Dakota for th about three weeks with her dog too, learning how to, to work it. And, um, and the seeing eye is so nice, uh, and most of the other guide dog schools are too, where they will, if I have any problems, they, the first thing you do is pick up the phone, they will try to talk you through it over the phone. If that doesn't work, they will send someone out. And, um, and so and when I was at Penn State, <laughs> um, I had somebody come out and we squirrel hunted because Penn State has very friendly squirrels and, <laughs> and drove my dog crazy and uh, she got loose from me a couple times and that is just a big no-no. They sent someone out pronto and spent three days we went out hunting for squirrels and learning how to, to know when my dog was slowing down and staring down a squirrel and stuff like that. Because those are things that now I know how to read that but um, it it takes a long time to for a first a first time dog service dog owner you have to learn how to read your dog and know what they're doing and know when they're not paying attention and um, so so yeah and the hearing you know I would think that it would you be there quite you know you have to have some training to know how to uh, communicate with a dog when you don't have when you can't you might not be able to verbally talk to them. If the yeah. human mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. verbal abilities, they use yeah. uh, verbal command. Yeah, the dog we or we or use both. Like the, the touch the, and yeah. Well, the seeing eye uses. So when I want her to go left, I use a left left left, but I use verbally and the hand cue. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and you know, sit is you know we sit, but we you tell them to sit, and um, down is you 
down, you know, there's just, there's hand cues as well as the, the verbal. So. And does the dog have cues for you of any type of dog that's been trained? Do they have cues back to you? The guide dog will stop and uh, most of mine lean into me and I'm sure that's how some of the, the psychiatric dogs, when she senses danger or doesn't want me to cross the street, they, they will put themselves in front of you or like lean into me. Um, or, or this one and my last one just got really nervous, like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't go there. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were just like, no, you can't be done. So, and you know, when your dog is telling you don't do something, you usually, you have to, you're, you, you pay attention because there's gotta be a reason. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Thank you. No problem. All right, thanks. Yeah.